Okay, good morning and welcome back. What you see, when you see what is up there on the screen, some of you or many of you will wonder as to why this is important in communication and some of you will think of mentally wandering off into other worlds, checking your Facebook accounts, emails and other things. So I want to get back to what Professor Sethi said yesterday in the beginning about our role as coaches. Now some coaches are very successful, some are not, but it's all, it also depends on the team. So only if the coach and the team work together, then you can win. But a fundamental requirement of team members is that at least in the beginning, you trust your coach blindly. Okay? If after some days, weeks, months, the coach doesn't deliver, you can get rid of the coach. But at least in the beginning, you'll have to believe in the coach. So I want to start by saying you'll have to trust us as to why we think this is important in terms of enhancing communication skills. This is brought uh, under the overall theme of ethics and Professor Sundar yesterday was mentioning about how ethics is to do with what to say, how to say it, what not to say, how not to say, those kinds of things. But ethics applies to, as Professor Sethi kept saying several times yesterday, to human beings. Primarily, okay, and since we are human beings, we are concerned with how to be ethical in communication so that that in enhances the efficiency of our communication. People don't turn off when you communicate scientific messages. But beyond that, we are not only human beings, we are also professionals. We are academics, we are professionals in different fields. And there is a certain expectation about professionals, about how they behave and how they communicate, what they can say, what they cannot say. Politics, for example, is not a profession. So there are less restrictions on what they can say and how they can say it. We are not. We are teachers. And again, to go back to yesterday, teachers have certain duties. Teachers may not get paid as much as actors and models, but teachers have a certain status in society. And that status comes because of the way which we behave and communicate and the expectations that society has and how we fulfill our duties. Therefore, it is imperative that we pay attention to issues of culture and language in communication. So Professor Sundar in the beginning mentioned something very important and it was followed up by the lectures on scientific method. He mentioned that scientific communication is culture and language independent and nobody can argue with that. But we claim us to be human beings, society does not treat everybody as human beings. So there are differences between men and women, older and younger people based on disabilities, language, religion, all kinds of inequalities exist. So in our communication, we have ensure that those biases, prejudices, inequalities do not consciously or unconsciously come into our communication. And though we may think that generally we are not consciously biased, prejudiced or bring those existing inequalities into our communication, unconsciously because of the way in which society is structured and communication about science has evolved, those things do creep in. And therefore, it becomes very important for us to pay attention to these issues. Most professional associations, academic bodies, journals, they all have guidelines now about how to incorporate these things. IEEE, for example, has guidelines on these kinds of issues. And of course, uh, in the workplace as well, as the world is becoming more uh, globalized, and as we strive for equality, uh, more and more women are in the workplace, people from different backgrounds are in the workplace. So it's very important that we communicate in a way which is sensitive to differences that exist in society and not reproduce inequalities and discriminations. Okay. So with that brief introduction, let me get into this. How many of you have heard of this term STEM? STEM, STEM. Not the biology, biological STEM that we talk about, STEM. Okay, STEM stands for 
science, technology, engineering and mathematics. These are the core science and engineering technology disciplines that are very important in modern worlds. Why is it relevant that we put these together in this particular way and address communication needs? It is important because in modern societies we know that science, technology, engineering, mathematics play a very important role in design solutions to various problems in very many different ways in different spheres of life. It is almost impossible to imagine life without these. But especially in countries like India, we want that the benefits of the knowledge from these disciplines percolate down to everybody, not just to a select few. Therefore, the way in which we teach science, technology, engineering, mathematics are very important because we are always very proudly claiming that India has the third largest scientific human resources in the world. What is the benefit of that to the country in terms of how we solve our problems, whether it's sanitation or food or health or anything else? We can send a mission to the Mars, but uh, we cannot prevent uh, diseases which have been prevented in many countries in the world. So there are many basic problems which still, which still persist. And that is being connected to the issues of gender and diversity. That is differences that exist in society which are converted by society into inequalities. So STEM is a concept that evolved primarily first in western countries and then spread around the world about an integrated approach to science, technology, engineering and mathematics. What kind of teaching, learning, communication should occur with respect to these disciplines and how that can help us to solve our various problems better. So what is being said here is that for long science, technology, engineering preserve of a select few. That is no longer true as it is reflected in and in the fact that you are all teaching in hundreds and thousands of colleges around the country. So we want to open up science, technology and engineering and mathematics beyond the preserve of a select few to everybody. While we are doing this, there is also considerable discussion not only in India, but even in countries like US that there is some kind of crisis that people are being more and more attracted to professions where they, can, they pay very high salaries, whether it is media or finance or marketing management, um, um, the entertainment industry and so on. So on the one hand, there are people who do not have access to education, even though they may have the skills and the talent and so on in science, technology, engineering, mathematics. On the other hand, we have a shortage of skilled professionals in these fields. So the need to bring in gender and diversity issues comes from this kind of a contradiction where we want more people to get involved in education and research with, with, uh, relating to science, technology, engineering and mathematics. Now this STEM is not just an acronym for these disciplines. There is a different kind of perspective in looking at these four set of subjects. So we are not just saying these are four different uh, of disciplines. We are saying that these four must be taught in an integrated and coordinated way to get the benefit. So some of you may be familiar with the uh, number of international schools that are coming up in India now and they offer something called coordinated science where in fact biology, physics, chemistry, mathematics are taught in an integrated way not separately, not in silos as Professor Tuck keeps saying all the time. So the benefits of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, we can get only if we look at them in a more integrated way, not separate them into narrow fields. Also, we look at them in a transdisciplinary manner. That is, there are certain methods we use in mathematics, there are certain techniques we use in uh, uh, science subjects, physics, chemistry and so on and engineering, which are for narrow applications in those areas. Transdisciplinary means that in looking at all of these in a holistic manner, we develop new methods, new approaches, new perspectives in solving problems. So we know for example, that if you want to address the problem of disease, it is related to 
climate change now it is related to hygiene and sanitation it is related to the physiology of the body there are so many different it's it's related to sociology and economics and so many things have to be looked at together to address a problem that's what we are trying to say now how do you define each of these science technology engineering and management and i think that is something that is very fundamental because most of us don't even talk about it so in india technology and engineering are used as substitutes so some colleges offer btech some offer be as though they are both the same they are not the same so science to put it very simply is the study of nature study of natural processes of what happens in nature to gain a better understanding of what is happening in nature technology is the modifications that we perform upon nature to fulfill human wants how do we modify nature using various kinds of tools and te techniques to get benefits for human beings engineering is a subset of technology because when we talk of engineering we are talking of designing under constraints so the constraint could be cost we want to develop something cheaper the constraint could be that we do not want to pollute something when we produce a product good the constraint could be that it has to be useful for different kinds of people so some something simple like this collar mic for you know many indian women are not able to use it because they wear sarees how can you design a microphone which women wearing different kinds of clothes can also wear so nobody ever thought about it because mostly it was men who were designing this product so it is designing under constraints to fulfill specific objectives it could be if you are trying to improve productivity of a crop rice or wheat it you have to take into consideration the soil physics the agronomy the weather the temperature evapotranspiration all kinds of things so engineering is to design something under certain kind of constraints it's much more specific and mathematics is the science of numbers where we look at trends and patterns of numbers and the logical relationship between numbers so what stem tries to do is to bring science and mathematics and see how those two interact and relate to technology and engineering in designing solutions for human beings so we need to relate this idea of stem to what we do in the classrooms how we research how we teach how we communicate what kind of methods we use and here is where the importance of gender and comes in so basically we are saying that every human being has equal worth it doesn't matter who you are what your background is whether your age ethnicity religion language every human being has equal worth also that every human being is capable of learning how do we as teachers then ensure that learning happens in the classroom and some people don't drop out so one of the key issues with stem is that we find in many parts of the world there is a large number of drop out of certain sections of the population across india you will see when the 10th class results come out girls outperform boys but where are the girls in the classroom in higher education they are less in number where are they in iits they are less than 10% where are they in engineering professions in scientists they are less the same thing applies to people from different backgrounds so how come children who perform very well in schools tend to drop out at levels what are the constraints so there are constraints society there are constraints from parents parents don't want to send girls for higher education those are not things which we can do much about but we can what we have under control is what happens in the classroom so can we make a difference as teachers in our communication so that we address crisis in so that there is more <laughs> equality the assumption is that the more diversity there is in science and engineering professions that is people from different backgrounds if they are involved in research and teaching and communication the more ideas will come out and the more solutions will come out so this has actually been shown um, through a lot of research by nobel prize winners like gary becker who has shown that the more diversity there is in a country, the more profitable it is the more innovative it is because people from different backgrounds bring together different ideas 
Now, I have been using this term gender and diversity and before even uh, to communication issues, let us try and understand what it means. So, as I was saying earlier, it starts out with this idea that all human beings are of equal worth. But society does not necessarily behave according to that, accept that. So, there are problems in terms of how we treat each other according to our backgrounds. So, we say that there are inequalities in society, but we do not want to bring them into our communication and education. So, as institutions, as colleges, as educational institutions, as professional bodies, academic associations, how do we ensure that we give equal attention to the interests of men and women and to people of different groups. So, a very simple um, way of doing it is to understand the difference between gender neutrality and gender awareness. So, gender neutrality means that when I am referring to uh, a group of people who consist of men and women, I do not refer to them all of them in terms of the masculine noun or pronoun. Okay. So, I am referring to an average person sitting here, I do not say he or his, I do not say all the men in this room because I know there are women also. But gender awareness means that I know that there are differences between men and women and that has to be incorporated into my communication, into research, into the way in which you problematize, where you formulate a problem and design solutions and so on. I will give you some examples later. So, we know that society itself is not equal, that society can be sexist, there is discrimination towards particular kinds of people or society is not welcoming of diversity, they are intolerant of people who are different from us. Does that affect how knowledge is generated and used? So, there are a lot of studies which show yes, that happens. But what can we do as teachers to ensure that the effect so, society's biases is minimized. So, we can incorporate greater sensitivity into our own communication, which is what we are going to do. So, in general, we that communication is effective if the audience is more responsive. If the audience rejects what you have to say or is bored or is not interested, then communication is not very effective. So, gender and because a lot of has shown that if we do not include everybody in our communication, whether it is written or oral, some people get put off and they may not, even though your article or book may be excellent, they like it because of the language in which it is written, which is not sensitive enough. And of course, as I was saying in the beginning, uh, most professional association journals, and workplaces, you know, whether it is Infosys or Accenture, all of them have these policies regarding gender and diversity, how to communicate in the workplace. So, it is you and your students and your colleagues will have better opportunities if we incorporate them. So, uh, our own placement office as well as studies in NASCOM, which is the national board of companies have shown that some of these issues, problems in communication uh, are reasons some people do not get selected jobs, even though their CVs may be excellent. They are very good in their subjects, but communication wise they suffer. One of the ways in which you can understand these things, because talking about gender and diversity in this general way is something uh, that may not resonate with all of us, especially those of us who have not faced troubled situations either in the classroom or in groups those who have not faced discrimination. So, this is a kind of exercise that you can do. So, you can say that if you are conducting this workshop with your uh, college teachers or with students, do this exercise. It is called I want you to know, where you divide yourselves or groups into groups of yourself into groups of 3 or 4, based on language or region you come from within India, gender and so on. You will be surprised issues actually emerge. 
So we've done this exercise in IIT, and a lot of interesting responses come. For example, we get a lot of uh, peers who are fairly senior. One of their common complaints is that they are not respected enough by teachers. But also, their age experience is not considered while designing exams, for example. So when you are asking a 22 year old to give an exam and you are asking a 45 year old to give an exam, you have to test different kinds of skills, not just simply memorizing. Okay. Also, most of the people tell us it's very difficult for us to sit for three hours and write an exam. Why can't you test us in a different way? So that's a very simple issue where older and younger students have different needs, but we simply treat all of them in put off some people and maybe even prevent them from learning or enjoying the learning experience which they have come here for. Or women's experience, for example, what kind of bias experience in the classroom? Usually what, what happens is when there are fewer classroom, if they respond to a question, boys tend to clap, boys tend to visit. For a period of time, what happens is girls or women, uh, they stop asking questions, they stop answering because they don't want to be jeered at. That reduces their ability to learn in the classroom. If you, learn, you can learn. So, like that, you will observe a lot of issues which affect learning in the classroom emerge when you do this kind of an exercise. You can do this kind of an exercise and then uh, ask yourself these kind of questions: What is it that you learned? Uh, what is it that you did not you did not know before? Because many people are surprised. People. Uh, boys themselves say, no, we never behaved in this way, but you, you could observe that they actually behaved in this way, which uh, you know, uh, prevented learning from happening from students, uh, girl students from asking certain kinds of questions to clarify doubts. These are some resources uh, in academics which uh, tell us more, uh, which give us guidelines about how to deal with these kinds of issues. And you do not have to write them down, we will give them to you. But right now what I wish to do is to do some exercises here in the classroom about Sensitizing ourselves to gender and diversity before we go more in depth into communication issues. Identify statements which are true or false. Let us do these exercises and then we will get down to games that we will do here. STEM stands for science, technocracy, education books, correct? False. Number two, true? Yeah. Number three, we will enhance the benefits of STEM to society. True. Should not influence the way which we teach. This is more complicated. It's true, no? It's true. It should not. That's what we are saying. STEM approach is integrative and transdisciplinary. Yes. So we are starting out with this idea that all written and spoken communication should be culturally sensitive, unbiased, simple, concise, concrete, and vivid. This is a general kind of advice that we have. All communication should be like this. That makes it more effective. And when we are specifically talking about sensitivity to gender and diversity issues, we are saying we ought to be consciously considerate of other people's beliefs, norms, and so on. So, usually, those of us who are good people, we do not hurt and insult others. Okay, if somebody wants to deliberately hurt you, not much you can do about it. Here we are focusing on what we do unconsciously. That is because of the way in which language has evolved, certain kinds of usage has crept, have crept into our language and especially it is a problem with English. You take something like Sanskrit or uh, uh, German for example, they have uh, uh, gender for everything. No, there is a gender, uh, male, masculine gender, feminine gender, neutral gender for everything. In Hindi, of course, everything, you know, bus has a gender, this has a gender, everything will have it, uh, uh, and we all get mixed up about it, okay? We do not know which is what. But English is not like that, okay? And because most of the communication in professional academia takes place in English, we have to know how to use language sensitively and because for a very long time in the history of human beings, 
It is men who have been dominant, who have written textbooks, who have done research, who have reported. Language has evolved as per their wishes, whims and fancies. So, we need to modify that. And that is because scientific communication should not reflect biases as I have repeated several times. So, what is biased or insensitive language? It is the use of words or terms that relies on unfounded assumptions. So, going back to what you were, uh, we covered yesterday about scientific method, even before we go to bias or insensitivity, this is not scientific. If I am, I use a sentence like, all men in this room, please stop writing. It is not only biased, it is unscientific, it is wrong. Okay? So, we are talking about the fact that we cannot make any statement that does not have evidence, that does not have proof, that does not have a basis in science. So, existing biases in society, whether it is gender bias or bias in terms of caste and race and so on, is based on unfounded assumptions, they are unscientific. We cannot bring that into our communication. So, simple example is here, exclusive use of masculine pronouns like he or him about both men and women, that is biased, insensitive, it is also unfounded, it is regarded as language that is sexist. So, we say that gender and diversity issues are important in scientific communication, not because they are politically correct, not because they are unbiased, unprejudiced and so on, but because it is the right way to communicate science. All technical writing has to be crystal clear, they cannot be vague, they cannot be ambiguous. So, if you use one kind of noun or pronoun, masculine noun he to refer to all human beings, both men and women, it is vague. And we will see using examples from the past about scientific work, where this kind of vagueness can have very serious consequences for the use of our knowledge. So, also as Professor Sundar mentioned yesterday, this is supposed to be culture and language independent. If you needlessly call attention to gender, ethnicity, religion in your communication, then it will take the focus off the scientific aspect of your communication. If you are talking about doing a research on doctors, doctors methods of diagnosis and you refer to lady doctors without talking about male doctors, it needlessly calls attention to the gender of a woman which is not the focus of your study. I will give you one example. So, this is from a class 5 science textbook. When my daughter was in class 5, she is now grown up. I do not look so old, but my daughter is grown up. In this, it says it is about environmental studies, what we call EVS. Man tries many things to, does many things to stop soil from eroding, he tries to conserve or protect the soil. Man cannot do much about stopping an earthquake and so on. So, after reading this, she asked me, Do only men do all of this or women also do all of this? So, this lesson is about environment, but her attention was diverted to the gender issue. What we, that is what we are trying to say here. It is vague, it is ambiguous, it is not clear about what the message is that the author is trying to give you. We do not want that. When I am writing, I want people to understand and not go off into some bylines and think about other things. On the other hand, so this is Azim Premji, who as you know is one of the biggest philanthropists in India the CEO of Wipro, he gives millions and billions of dollars for rural education in India. He is especially interested in supporting uh, women's education, education for girls. And you can see in this article, which he has written, in the first part, he is referring to the child, which can be both male and female, as her. Because he wants to draw attention to the fact that many of us actually make these kinds of mistakes. And those mistakes come because of the kind of biases that exist in society, wherein most parents in India give preference to boys for education when it comes to girls, because of which this inequality ex exists. He wants to draw our attention to that, because if Azim Premji had used his, most of us would not have noticed. If he had, because he has used her, we immediately spot it. Why is he saying this? Okay. In the next sentence, he is using what is called as a pronoun plural. 
himself herself which is the correct way of referring to children because there are both boys and girls or in this example where this of course don't uh, assume after reading this sentence that everybody who plagiarizes is a woman okay is just to draw attention so sometimes some authors deliberately use the feminine noun or pronoun to draw our attention to the fact that most people do otherwise or you can see even in the case of technical guides and manuals this kind of uh, pronoun pairs his or her is used to make it gender neutral or gender fair instead of referring to only likewise in india we have the ncert which has given these guidelines for making textbooks as well as cds and other electronic material where they want you to ensure content is free of these kind of stereotypes for example in the use of names of in problems in mathematics or in science the names of through which you explain various kinds of concepts you know or you have a problem ram does this rahim does this usually it's boys okay and there are very few geetas and fatimas and all of that mostly your boys names are over represented there or even in terms of how you explain so uh, you know there was a hindi textbook i looked at some time back where a lesson about the post office is explained through a boy who goes to the post office a lesson on flowers is explained through a girl who spends some time in the garden so girls they have to be in the garden they like flowers they can't do useful things like going to the post office only boys can do that it so it sends out certain kinds of messages which enhances feelings of stereotypes and biases in society that is what we want to avoid okay so that nobody is over represented or under represented likewise as i mentioned earlier ieee or american society of mechanical engineers and i can give you hundreds of more examples all of them have these guidelines in place now for professional communication to avoid these kinds of um, biases and to ensure that uh, sensitivity is taken care of in your communication as scientists we want to do these three use language to build credibility for our work and for what we have to say in the class could be as professor sundar mentioned yesterday about reproduction we pass on knowledge in the classroom to for reproduction but also so that students can use that knowledge to build upon it and discover new things usage should be used to the examples that i gave earlier about the science textbook it means that if a person is not language that person doesn't care whether i understand what is being said or not doesn't care about so it does same thing can happen in the class use insensitive language students stop listening to me so we demonstrate that about what we have to say by using sensitive language so so these are the kinds of scientific address something that professor sundar mentioned in the in the beginning yesterday as well so depending on whom you are speaking to whether it's a political leader a minister bureaucrat your own colleagues in discipline a lay person writing a newspaper article so you will communicate differently to all of them see we are saying that there will be communication failure or resistance if you do not consider the audience's background in terms of the fact that they, they are very varied in terms of ethnicity and religion and caste and region language gender and all this we can do that is our communication of can be made more effective if we appeal to what is common and ignore or sideline what is different about we are all human beings first only then all the other differences come so how to address those commonalities in the workplace in dealing with clients or in funding agencies government officials all kinds of communication this has becomes very important we want to ensure that everybody understands everybody learns we don't want anybody to lose out so it is possible that people have different backgrounds have been to different kinds of schools different kinds of skills talents abilities not all of us have equal talents in everything 
but our job in the classroom is to ensure that everybody uh, uh, understands and learns and that you cannot do if you treat everybody as equals. So what we are saying is try to understand how we can include everybody in our communication. A student in a, one of my classes a couple of years ago who um, was very bad at writing, half the answers he would not write, he will leave it blank, he would write very small answers, one paragraph if we am asking him to write three pages. But he was mathematical skills. So I spoke to one of my psychology colleagues, he says it's one kind of other abilities. So in the classroom, even though he had not done mathematics after 10th standard, he used to be excellent in addressing mathematical issues in the classroom, whereas other students struggle. Whereas if it came to writing, he couldn't do it. So how do I recognize the different abilities of students and ensure that each of them does well in terms of learning by designing different kinds of learning systems, designing different kinds of examinations, assessments and so on. That is what we are trying to do here. That you can do only if you first recognize that everybody is capable of learning, everybody has equal worth, nobody is uh, bad, nobody is less just because they are women or because they are something else. Okay? So let, me, let us do some exercises here to understand what is meant by stereotypes. So if you have stereotypes, we will think everybody is equal, it is their responsibility to learn, there is nothing wrong with me or my style of teaching my style of communication, it is a problem with them. That is because we do not understand unconsciously our own stereotypes of others. So there are two people here. Can you guess the occupation of these two persons? Person on the left and the person on the right? Huh? Lady is sports and the other is a professor. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, so appearances are based on certain it is based on certain assumptions that we have. They may be biases, they may not be. They are based on certain assumptions that we have, based on our past experience. But as I said earlier, in scientific communication, there is no space for assumptions. You can assume, but you have to test out the hypothesis. <laughs> okay. So most of us would assume that this person on the left because of the kind of dress she is wearing and the way she is having her hair is a sports person. The person on the right because like me has a beard, wears glasses, has white hair, wears a, wearing a lab coat, has to be a scientist. It is possible this person is an actor who is playing the role of a professor or a doctor. It is first possible this person is actually a scientist and at this point of time is wearing a sports dress. This person is a very famous GIS scientist <laughs> okay? and this person is actually a professor but this person is also a scientist. Okay? With ESRI is one of the most, uh, you all know of ESRI. ESRI makes this software called uh, ArcView and ArcInfo, GIS software it means. So we need to avoid stereotypes in our communication. So there have been hundreds of tests called this draw a scientist test. It has been performed in schools and colleges around the world where it is shown that if you ask people to draw a scientist, they will usually draw somebody like this. Rarely women, no? mostly men, mostly wearing, having a beard, mostly wearing glasses. Okay? So we, we can see here itself that you know, except for me probably nobody else has a beard. Still you are all scientists. Okay? So it is very important to avoid such stereotypes. Let us do another test. So, so you have black and white. What are these black and white? Black and white are colors. So black is actually dark blue here and white is pink. <laughs> okay. Okay. Which of these gives you a positive connotation? These two. How many of you think black gives you a positive connotation? One person. I'll come, uh, two people, I'll come back to you. How many of you think white? What about the rest of you? <laughs> Sleeping, okay. Somewhere between, no, gray. Okay. So, the two people who said black has a positive connotation, can you tell us why? It's very bright. It's very bright. Black is bright. bright. Uh, it's attractive. Black is bright and attractive, okay. 
I thought black is uh, denotes darkness, no? That uh, if I remember that song, Danush, no? Why this color variety? Night color, black, black. No, that's <laughs> so supposed to reflect da darkness, isn't it? Okay. Night background is white, no? White color is moon. If you remember that song, okay. So somebody is there, yeah? Black is looking like black. Black is looking like black. Black is looking like black. Okay. About those of you who said white gives you positive connotations, why do you think so? Most of you say, believe, peace. yeah. Peace, peace. Purity. purity, assumptions, yeah, purity, peace. What else? Color dominates the world. Okay, in what way? Right now, if you go outside, it's all grey. In monsoon, for four months, we don't see white. Huh? Gives a cool feeling. Okay. Let's do one more. So this one is an earthworm. This is a parrot or a parakeet, I don't know. Parrot. So which of these do you feel is more repugnant? The moment you say, you see it, you see yuck. Earthworm, not a parrot. Which gives you positive feelings compared to the other? Parrot. Parrot, OK. What? If you are an agriculturalist or a farmer, first one, isn't it? Because a parrot is a pest which is going to destroy all your crops. So, in stereotypes, in avoiding stereotypes, we also need perspective. So, in science, avoid assumptions which do not have a basis but also have a perspective. So, you can see here both black and white can be positive, both of them are smiling, isn't it? Very pleasant to see both of them. Does not matter what the skin color is. Or parrot can actually be a pest depending on how you look at it. Whereas if you look at it purely from an aesthetic perspective, it looks more pleasant. But it, that aesthetic is affected by the fact that we are not as most of us. <laughs> okay, aesthetics comes from somewhere. From what we have learned, can you answer these? Scientific communication should be inclusive rather than exclusive yeah somebody mentioned that that's good that's the right one forms of communication should not be stereotyped or offensive uh, use of gender neutral language is more than just it's more than critical correctness okay? it's not for that reason that we are doing it because we want to be scientific in our communication that's what by using appropriate accurate language what do we demonstrate trustworthiness trust okay trust in our communication Finally, good academic or technical communication, it communicates without ambiguity, ambiguities. Okay. Which one is false? First one, always stand and speak by considering other people's perspectives. True? True? Insensitive speech is not limited to a specific group of words. This I didn't mention there, but from what, yeah, it's true? Yeah. All written, spoken communication should be? True. D. False. So these are the kind of questions uh, you can yourselves devise. There is, we'll give you plenty of uh, material on these topics. There's been uh, huge interest in this. So you can, but most of it is Western origin. So you can yourself design examples and methods to teach this, and then design for your students. Um, this is a kind of assignment that you can do. I'm I'm not asking you to do it now. Not too many assignments in one day. Okay, so you can select an article from a newspaper journal, write a short essay. To what extent is the audience's cultural background and gender issue addressed properly in this? Is there use of gender aware language? The content, whether it is free of stereotypes. So especially, you can look at reporting of crimes against women, reporting against crimes of against specific communities, reporting political statements by politicians. To what extent are these things incorporated or not? So that's the kind of assignment you can give. You can also take uh, articles, uh, academic articles, 
those which have uh, actual usage in society, not just uh, theoretical ones, but about technologies which are which have an application, uh, adoption of these technologies, impact assessment of these technologies, and see to what extent uh, uh, these issues are incorporated in that particular essay. So that's the kind of assignment that you can do or you can ask your students to do. Another assignment you can think of is this one. This is a general one for you to self reflect and also for your colleagues in the during the MOOCs course about how would you describe the need for communication that is sensitive to these issues. So I have certain ways, but everybody will have a particular context. So in your own college for example, in an institution where male and female students and teachers are roughly equal, the issues will be different from a situation where the majority are men. So how would you describe the need for communication that is sensitive to these kinds of issues? It also depends on the background. So you know, I had a discussion with uh, a teacher in college in Bombay because of its location and because it is a publicly funded institution, most of the students who come there come from poor backgrounds. So he was talking about what kind of communication is required in those kinds of situations. So depending on your context, you can think of how to be sensitive in this. And what you can also do is to form groups of four and five, four or five, have peer evaluation of those. So do they agree with what you have to say? Do they think you have missed out on some points? And you can prepare an inventory of communication which is sensitive or insensitive pass it around to your colleagues and see how you can improve your own communication in the classroom or in written communication.